Hello. Nice. Yeah. I mean, for those who are on Spotify, they don't know this, but we are doing our first episode where we record with video. So if you check out our YouTube, you'll see our lovely faces. Welcome, everybody, to what is now, I think, the 14th episode of the Morality of Everyday Things. It's a lot of morality we've sent you away. There's a lot of everyday things, Jacob. This week, we're going to be discussing the morality of keeping pets. I'm, I'm going to give a little disclaimer. I stepped up. I did my duty. I got my vaccine yesterday. So I'm feeling a little crummy today. I was convinced like, oh, I'm a big tough guy. I'm going to be fine. Like, whatever. It's not, not going to hurt me. But yeah, it really, like, I was feverish last night. Don't worry, by the way. It doesn't, it doesn't make you, um, it doesn't make you contagious or anything like that. Yeah, it was worse than I expected. Like, and I haven't, the thing is, it's been so long since I've been ill. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's just your microchip. So I've settled into <laughs> Bill Gates. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously a joke. Sweet. Okay. And this question then, one thing before we, uh, before we dive right in, thank you to everyone who's subscribed and listened to the show so far. Do please drop us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah. It, it you know, costs nothing, but it's, it honestly is a huge help to us. If you enjoy this even a little bit, head over there, leave us a quick review. If you want to get more information, then follow us on social media or use Substack. Cool. Nice. Right on to the question. This is interesting because as you'll have noticed if you're a regular listening to the show, and, and I tend to find that we largely agree on the issues that we discuss. Largely. This week, I think we found one that to begin with, we took pretty different stances on. So I remember when Ant posed this question to me one day at lunch and I was like, now nah, it's a stupid question, man. <laughs> yeah. It's, it is interesting how when people think about this, you know, we're so accustomed to having pets that for, you know, a lot of the time we just kind of think it, it's stupid to even consider, is it wrong to own a dog? Of course not. Well, that's, a, that's your first thought, but then you think about it a bit more deeply. Exactly. And actually to, to dive right in, I mean, this question sits in the middle of a bigger question of whether animals have rights in general or should have those rights. Humans and animals have coexisted for millennia. Not always peacefully. The human race is responsible for killing off a lot of the most interesting animals that ever existed. Hey man, animals had it coming. They killed some humans too. I'm watching. I'm watching you. <laughs> Funny because when I when I zoom into the camera here, yeah, it's not quite. It's a there. Yeah. Anyway, I think the interesting thing is, like you said, um, it's discussing the rights that animals and humans have. The distinctions or, or whether there are distinctions. This kind of links a lot to the vegetarian vegan argument we're discussing. Where do you kind of think of? of the rights of living beings as a scale where humans or animals are in different parts of the scale? Do you think of it as distinct categories, etc.? And how do you use that distinction to justify the ownership of pets without justifying some sort of weird relationships between people? Because in effect, it can become quite hard to simultaneously hold at least the most staunch vegan vegetarian perspectives being that, you know, animals have equal rights to humans, but then also believe in, you know, ironically, a lot of those sorts of people are very fond of pets, but it's hard to hold that view whilst, you know, simultaneously saying they have equal rights to humans. And then also saying that you shouldn't be able to do the same things to humans, which looks a lot like having slaves. Slavery is a strong accusation, but we will come back to that. Yeah. Um, last thing I was Jake just, is a slave driver. And the last thing I was just going to say was in the history of humans and animals coexisting, animals have been used for labor, for sport for things like lab testing. There's there's a lot of different issues to get into, uh, but we're gonna set those aside. And for this episode, we are just gonna focus on the issue of keeping animals as pets. I guess sometimes the line might get blurred. Like a farmer might describe a certain animal as a pet. You know, they're not gonna call their horse a pet, but they may well call their dog a pet, but the dog actually does some useful stuff. Or there's guide dogs for the blind, right? Where they sort of sit in this middle ground of like pets and helpers. I don't even know if that's in the middle ground. They're just not pets, they're, they're a utility. Mm, but I imagine people still have like that same sort of yeah, affectionate that's, relationship that's that you tend to characterize pet ownership as having true i guess one other one oh it was here a second ago sorry guys vaccine mind right now the microchip speaking to me the other one that i was going to say was a lot of people have pet dogs for safety right like guard um, dogs. yeah like well the thing is you there's a difference between having a guard dog and having a pet dog and being conscious of part of the reason you have that pet is because it might confer some safety you know so like someone who's at home alone a lot might like to have a dog because it makes them feel safe and knowing that the dog would say for example a lot of if someone's coming to the house is mm -hmm. a legitimate use but it's still a pet right they're not mm -hmm. a guard dog like you wouldn't replace the dog with a security alarm yeah but it's more useful than a hamster <laughs> <laughs> speak for yourself mate my brother, my brother had an excellent hamster quick hamster side note 
Tino, if you're listening to this, this is your fault, man. My brother left me to take care of his hamster one weekend. Uh, oh, man, where is this going? This sounds horribly tragic. Yeah, it's, it's, quite, it's quite tragic. It's, quite, it's funny. He didn't think to tell me that the cage kind of gets quite stuck. So he's a bit broken. So like it clicks, but you have to really like get it to shut by like clicking it hard. So I go up, I feed the hamster one day, click it once. Don't like force it shut. It's his fault. He should have told me that. Should have told me that, Tino. <laughs> should have told me that, Tino. So I come back like a day or two later. And I'm like, hmm, he must be like hiding in his little hut or something. He was not hiding in his hut. Oh, he, he disappeared. Oh, no. <laughs> he, he had made the great hamster escape. And um, what was his name, the hamster? Tono. 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 Tino and Tono. Yeah, my brother's name is Tino, for those who yeah. don't know, or Constantine, Tino for short. Tono means like tuna in, idi- in Italian. I think it's also slang for like an idiot. Okay. You tuna. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Anyway, this thing like <laughs> crawled out and got. But also, my brother's uh, fridge had short-circuited. So, you know, two, two and two, I texted him, like, I was like, really sorry, mate. It was like little hamster emoji, lightning emoji, skull emoji. <laughs> <laughs> what a way um, to break the news. Yeah, I know, I know. Actually, you know what? He was hiding in some recess somewhere. I was convinced he was dead. But my brother was like, if he's alive, there's one way to get him to come out. So he just grabbed a little pack. Of, of seeds and like shook it by where we thought like the little recess the little hole in the wall we thought he was hiding in and, and suddenly there's a little like and he sticks his little head out and he just grabs him <laughs> and like, we stuck him back in the cage and he'd like you know he drinks water so quickly and all of his little um whiskers were all like fried from chewing, <laughs> on, from chewing on the wires and the also sorry guys to clarify this is not neglect this is a genuine accident um you know this is it, it was a very yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. thank you, thank you for that introductory <laughs> anecdote. Uh, yeah. And now onto the question of why do people keep pets at all? <laughs> yeah. Um, so do you want to do you want to give any kind of more specific definition to the term pet as opposed to other types of animals? Is it just an animal that you own for entertainment purposes? I don't know if I'd even go as far as entertainment. In answering the question, why do people keep pets? I think we get that definition, right? So from research that they conducted, they the internet <laughs> I'd source somewhere but primarily they sur- like whoever they are they there was a survey done of a lot of american households uk households they did a survey of them <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can i be any less specific so most people in answer to the question why do you keep pets answer for companionship or for happiness or there's there is a small subset of people who as uh, we discussed in the case of guide dogs and such you have some kind of or, or guard dogs there's there's help and, and utility conferred but primarily it's companionship and, and and happiness and i think um some fun stats for you listeners 85 million u.s households keep pets which is actually 67 percent of households i was about to say like if there's only 300 and something million people average yeah. household is going to be several people that's that's a lot that's a lot of people it's more than the uk where we keep 41 where 41 percent of households keep pets uh, and in both cases it's mainly cats and dogs so, like, the vast majority of people are keeping one or You say that. If Tiger King taught me anything, there's, there's, a, lot, there's a lot of exotic pet, pets in the US. Yeah, that's okay, cool. Those too. So now let, let, let's like kind of quickly go through the reasons why, just, you know, off the top of the head, why might it be wrong to keep pets? According to what we wrote earlier, there are a couple, and one relates to idiots who, for example, don't close the hamster cage properly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, firstly... This is, I don't think, the contentious part, and maybe not the kind of meat of the moral issue that we want to discuss. It's pretty much like not really much to debate that people shouldn't keep pets if they can't meet their physiological or or emotional needs. You know, if it's going to be an unfit space, if they're not going to be able to be taken care of, etc. And actually, you know, also certain breeds, right? So Tiger King is actually a good example of this. Great example. It's, it's just not appropriate to try and domesticate those kind of animals. They don't really survive in domestication. They're not happy. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, this that kind of reminds me, it jogs my mind. I'm sorry if the person listens to this and recognizes themselves in this anecdote. Part of the reason I asked this question is because I met a friend of a friend who owned a large golden retriever and they lived in a flat in central London. And like, I saw it and I was like, this dog is super cute. Oh, that's great. And I, but... I was also immediately like, that's pretty like crappy for that dog. Generally, they're the kind of breed that would need a lot of space to run yeah. around, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, and, and it might be very gratifying for you. Maybe that's a dog you really wanted. But it, uh, sorry to that person, but it, it did strike me as, oh, maybe that's not meeting the animal's needs. Maybe it's a little selfish. Prioritizing your enjoyment uh, over, over that. And also, I mean, people, for example, you know, there's tons of dogs in existence, but 
people putting pressure on breeders to breed specific dogs because they're the ones that they like the look of and things. Thinking of pugs? But yeah, pu I mean, specifically, yeah, bred dogs that are bred to also be really unhealthy. Golden Retrievers, huge cancer rates. This was kind of part of what made me bring this question to you. For those who didn't get it, Jake's a big dog fan. Uh, you know what? I was a big dog fan like two years ago. I've seen a few people get dogs recently, and dogs are like shitty kids. <laughs> dogs, like, <laughs> it's a bit harsh. dogs are like all of the bads of having children, and then they never grow up. Like, instead of like reaching teenagehood and then becoming an adult, they reach teenagehood and die. Oh, but I think some people might even argue that dependency, for want of a much nicer <laughs> word, is actually <laughs> part of the appeal of pets you get to care for. Well, them. that sounds like people who have psychological needs that they're trying to fill. Yeah. Selfishly. As we'll discuss. But you raise a really interesting point. And I, I took this question to my parents um, a week ago when, after we discussed it. And I said, you know, what do you think? And their initial response was, it's wrong in the case of people who aren't able to meet an animal's needs. So COVID, I think, gave rise to a lot of people um, getting pets in people who probably wouldn't have done otherwise, but they were like, I'm going to be stuck in, in at home a lot. I need, I, you know, the companionship be great. But if you're living in a city, like in the case of your, your friend or friend of a friend, or in the case of different particular types of animals i think i think it's actually it's very clear cut to say if you're not in a position to meet an animal's biological or psychological or physiological needs whatever then yeah it probably is wrong know. to keep an animal in in those circumstances the difficulty is different people will argue that those are different right so some people will be like, it's subjective as to what an animal needs or it can be mm. right i mean and and also certainly aside morals aside there's certainly no laws where we test it mm. um within reason there might be things where it's like Maybe it's like gun ownership where they check like what well, license. license or something. Yep. Um, but then another thing, and this is kind of the more fundamental one, as we kind of mentioned in the intro. Okay, what if you actually believe that animals are autonomous beings? What if you? How are you going to categorize their rights and yet permit their existence essentially purely for for your enjoyment? And the fact that like legally and in all practical terms they are your property yes um, that's the key word there yeah it? in fact you know it's worth noting that like often when it's inconvenient we we put animals down right yeah, okay inconvenience is one circumstance it can be actually out of a case of like yeah. benevolence and but the, but the point is that we treat them distinctly from human beings so my issue is it seems about how how do we square people who love animals so much and yet actually are essentially keeping you know keeping them I don't want to say trapped, but basically breeding them into this kind of, I can't think of another word, trapped situation for their enjoyment. I just find it hard to square. I find it, and I find it hard to define their set, like an acceptable way of defining their rights that permits breeding weird breeds that look cute, neutering and, and, and spaying and castrating them. You know, all of the kind of negative things that, that come with creating animals purely for your enjoyment and how that is acceptable if you know typical vegan vegetarian arguments against livestock grazing is unacceptable right i mean if anything enjoyment is more frivolous than than food and and uh, nutrition right well we've certainly seen that in the case of covid laws right it's yeah. tended to be that you know we have rules around things that we deem essential and yeah. generally enjoyment seems to be well yeah people generally are like there's time to enjoy life later for now let's focus on surviving <laughs> which i yeah is a thing in itself but i think that's kind of a, a we kind of pointed to the question right to, to give a sort of analogy that's also related to animals it's why we outlaw things like fox hunting right because it's something where it's like this is purely for your own enjoyment in that case an animal is very clearly suffering but it's very easy to make a moral case as to why that's mm -hmm. non-essential and, and and why that's a bad thing yeah I suppose in that instance, the, the problem is that the, the thing is suffering. Exactly. I think that makes it clearer cut. Yeah. But enjoyment seems like too frivolous a reason. Whereas yeah. an animal suffering for people consuming and eating them, yeah. different case. Yeah. And I, I suppose the, the argument that most pet owners will make in immediate retort to this is, my pet loves me. Mm -hmm. right? I'm, I'm, I'm good to my pet and my pet enjoys the situation. And again, I, I suppose the difficulty is twofold. One, just focusing on animals, I think that a lot of livestock farmers would argue outside of battery conditions, you know, there, there are certainly going to be livestock farmers who say, I have happy animals, and they'll make arguments like, yes, I might kill them for nutrition, but like they have a good life up to that point, and the death is like instant, unexpected, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That's perhaps a weaker one. But then the main one is, like I said earlier, you need to provide a, a moral framework to explain how animals should be treated that doesn't permit this with humans, right? Because, the, you know, by analogy, 
if I treated a human in this way, their enjoying it or, or you know, being happy with it would absolutely not make it okay. Like if I, if I were a slave owner, but I treated my slaves very well, uh, I think most of us would agree that that doesn't justify being a slave owner. Again, I'm using a, a bit of an extreme and pejorative term to make the point that, you know, if you're, tr if you're trying to make the argument like fox hunting, like these things have rights and we need to respect those rights as living beings, their, you know, being happy with it doesn't change the fact that you are basically owning or, or not respecting their rights fully. Okay, so just to summarize where we've got to so far, there are two reasons we think why it might be wrong to keep animals as pets. Mm. The first is kind of a practical one. If you're not in a position to keep them under decent circumstances, meet their needs, then I'd say that's a fairly unambiguous case that even animal lovers would get behind as it would be wrong. Most pet owners, I think, would agree. You mentioned it may be subjective as to what we deem appropriate, but by and large, that's clear. The second one is more philosophical and I guess where we're going to focus more of our effort, which is that if you believe animals should have rights as autonomous beings, then to treat them as property in the way that we currently structure pet ownership is wrong. And to get really emotive, you called it a form of slavery. Mm. Right. <laughs> Obviously, we should live, you know, in a partnership. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Oh, I, I botched that quote, but whatever. Animal Farm, that was George. Yeah, we, we got it, mate. Well done. Ooh, let's read. Right. <laughs> Shut up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's expand on this. I, before we get into this, I want to make two assumptions. Okay. Um, just to, just to clarify this. So assumption number one, I think to avoid prejudice, let's assume benevolence on the part of pet owners. Kind of anything else I think would be to fall into that first argument of like, if we assume pet owners aren't kind and, and doing this out of love and, and a genuine sort of intent of companionship, I think then we stray into that like, you know, well, it's wrong for that reason. So I, I think that's a fair assumption to make, right? I'm going to, I'm going to permit that assumption. Thank you. But... I do want to point out that from a utilitarian perspective, um, actually, the fact that that is not 100% the case could be a strong reason. It does matter. You could make the argument that suffering of an unnecessary suffering of animals is unacceptable. Some number of pet owners are not benevolent. And so allowing pet ownership like effect effectively guarantees that some number of animals will suffer because of terrible pet ownership. And, and just to put some numbers on that, I think it's as many as six and a half million animals in the US end up in rescue shelters, which yes. is, is that in the US or is that in the UK? Bear with me. I'll just double check that. <laughs> That's like one tenth of the UK's population. It's, it's, that must be the US. It is in the US. And that the reason I kind of wanted to, to assume away that is I think, again, animals ending up in rescue shelters because they've been badly treated. Again, I think even animal lovers would get behind as wrong. So yeah. we're, I, I'm kind of more- I get what you mean. I, I wanted to make that little practical point that you, fair, could, yeah. you could make a utilitarian argument that even if you treat pets well, you should accept that it shouldn't be allowed to stop other people to guarantee that they can't do it. Sure. But it, in order to address the moral issue that I think we're more interested in, I will permit this assumption. Yeah, we want to focus on the case of a loving family where people feel the pet is basically part of the family, which is something, yeah, I can identify with and possibly Tino and Tono. <laughs> to how strong that bond was, but... Oh, man, that was... <laughs> I remember the day that they buried Tono. Oh. It was rather unceremonial. <laughs> it was just stuck in a little uh, hedge somewhere. Oh, no. What in was a little shoebox. <laughs> what was it that finally did him in? He's a hamster. They just don't live that long. Like, I, I think he just, at some point... Was he was very old for a hamster. He survived the the whisker uh, <laughs> incident. lived lived quite a lot longer than that. But you know, at some point, he just, just didn't wake up one morning. Oh. And Tino sat on him. <laughs> 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 but no, 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 no. It was it was um, he just died of natural causes at some point. Assumption two. You said assumption two. Assumptions. There's two assumptions, and this is a counterpoint that I raised. But I think I wanted to kind of assume this away because it's a bit not trivial, but I think it it misses the point. So. What you might think immediately is, well, if you want to outlaw pet ownership, if you think it's wrong, then what would happen to the existing set of animals? Um, yeah, it's a fairly natural yeah. thing to think about, but I think we want to assume a way that if that were the case, obviously we have a moral imperative to treat the last sort of animals that exist yeah. as pets as kindly as possible. Just to stop breeding. But to stop breeding them. Yeah. So I basically, before you worry about, like, if we're saying this, we should mass cull like yeah. all the pets in the world. No, I don't think that's a, a realistic sort of outcome. I think the practical thing to do is to care for the existing set of animals yeah i think and again we keep coming to this analogy which you seem to dislike but the analogy would be someone saying we can't ban slavery because what are we going to do with all of these slaves right like which which obviously is a ridiculous argument like they, like step one stop making them step two support the ones that currently exist and i suppose the difficulty with animals versus slaves is that you know slaves you can 
you should support and nurture into free people, like as in giving them support to access property and things like that, which actually the US did a terrible job of and is part of the reason there's still big systemic inequality. But you know, in the case of animals, like a lot of these animals are now literally bred for them, bred, bred to, yeah, bred to the point where they like there is no freeing them, right? Mm, which is a challenge. And so if that were the case, then there kind of becomes a policy question around whether you should continue to breed them or just yeah. kind of kindly yeah, yeah. phase that out. So yeah, just again, like if if we, if you were to fall down on the side of, okay, we shouldn't keep animals as pets, that's not to say that existing pets should be yeah. turned out or, 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 or what was ridiculous. What was that thing where like, uh, I don't want to spread misinformation, but wasn't there like some stat around like animal charities who put down a ridiculous number of animals because they can't home them? I, yeah, I don't have a number for that, but yeah. I imagine it happens. I, d I don't know that it, it I'm just mentioning it because it popped to mind that like it's not too relevant. So let's, uh, let's dive right into the question. And I, I guess the obvious place to start is what rights do animals have and what rights should they have? Mm -hmm. I suppose the first answer is fairly easy. <laughs> I suppose there's, there's a couple things to consider, right? Like, first of all, the rights that animals specifically should have as living beings. But then maybe we can also explain a little bit about, about freedom, assuming that freedom is something that a, a living being should have. And we can talk about, we can just touch on some of the forms of freedom that things should have, right? Let's do it. So I think we'll, we'll start the other way around, actually, talk about those forms of freedom. I think the most famous philosopher in this regard is probably Isaiah Berlin. Mm -hmm. And he talks about positive and negative freedoms, right? Positive and negative freedoms, yeah. So I think that the easiest way to think of negative freedoms is freedom from, uh, and it tends to be freedom from, you know, typically physical impediments, you know, practical impediments, like being chained up is a negative freedom issue. Uh, being imprisoned is a negative freedom issue. You know, being locked in the house as a dog, the negative freedom issue. Positive freedom would be more like uh, freedom to do the do what you would do in the best circumstance for yourself. Okay. The, the positive freedom is much more ambiguous, right? Mm -hmm. I think the point there is that, like, if I'm free to take heroin and I take heroin every day, we want to try and articulate the point that, like, okay, you're not quite free. Like, the thing that is is stopping you might not be in the physical world, but there's something stopping you from, from doing what you yeah. may want to, what may be in your best interest, right? Mm, fully self-actualizing. Yeah, <laughs> some sort of wanky term like that, right? Um, Thanks, mate. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, like, all those dogs, they just want to self-actualize, man. <laughs> Top of the Maslow hierarchy yeah. of needs. Dog yeah, exactly. <laughs> Kibble. Dog bed. <laughs> Express myself as a philosopher king. <laughs> you know, actually, you make that joke. I've been reading a little like a short story recently. Uh, it's called Investigations of a Dog. Mm -hmm. It's a Kafka short novel about a dog who's a philosopher. <laughs> What's his name? Plato? Pluto? <laughs> <laughs> that would have been good. I actually can't remember his name. I don't think he says his name. He just says the whole thing from his first person perspective. Uh, and it's just like how he, oh, I, I notice I'm different from the other dogs. And uh, it, it's all, it's, it's just quite funny. But sorry, so back on that, we talked a bit about negative and positive freedom. So there's an issue of, of negative freedom in that, you know, they're literally constrained by what you're telling them to do and then beyond that okay you can treat your dog very freely but i suppose the, the question of positive freedom is can they properly self-actualize for lack of a better word in in the way that is actually perhaps best in their own interest or in their own nature within the confines of a domesticated setting at all like even if you did everything to give them all the space and, and there was no need you know you weren't one of those people who like sets the schedules for them and stuff are we assuming that wild animals are able to achieve this we're assuming like they're not being poached and stuff like that i don't know maybe we're kind of just taking this a little too far behind this <laughs> yeah, let's, let's wait let's take a step back first so We've articulated negative and positive freedom. To be honest, I just thought it was a nice place to kind of discuss it a bit. Let's discuss the rights that animals have as living beings and then see whether negative and positive freedom applies. Sure. So where do you think, we discussed this in the vegetarian vegan argument, how do you think that the rights that animals have as living beings relate to the ones that humans have? Yeah, this was tricky. In that episode, we came up with a few different like models for, for how we can conceptualize it because the one model simply goes, we're all living beings we should all be subject to the same rights and yeah. therefore to kill any animals is tantamount to killing and eating humans murder is wrong therefore mm. killing yeah. animals is murder and therefore that's wrong I, I think that's maybe a little bit simplistic although it's very hard to really pin down why we talked about capacity for suffering as being something that delineates it so then if you were to consider animals being on a spectrum for how much they can suffer you've got humans at the one end who can suffer deep psychological angst <laughs> 
<laughs> like, they can, they can suffer <laughs> like different levels because of our supposedly higher levels of consciousness. Supposedly. Well, yeah. You don't know what a dog's thinking. We don't know what a dog's thinking. I, I didn't realize a dog wrote a play. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So there's, uh, I think on the basis of suffering is I know that's how Peter Singer um, sort of talked. Does Peter about. Singer characterize them as essentially equal? I remember I saw him talk once and he said, okay, practical situation. I'm starving. If I had to eat something like an oyster, I probably would. I wouldn't like, you know, some seafood that sort of probably experiences much lower level of consciousness would at a push be acceptable obviously he's okay. a animal rights activist and a, and a strong yeah. utilitarian top hit from singer article by him saying all animals are equal i mean what does this say I, I know that people have discussed for example should animals have the vote which sounds ridiculous but it's kind <laughs> of a you know follow on from that that's actually a, a good example of like okay is it actually just you know ignoring reality it to say that, that there are some clear differences right okay so so options are all the same, seems to be what Peter Singer says, some sort of spectrum, you base that on suffering or some form of sentience. Another might be that they're distinct categories. That was the other one that we talked about. Uh, and I suppose we were making categorizations again on the basis of like suffering, sentience, intelligence. Um, what else did we talk about? Uh, well, we basically, and uh, that I think was trying to answer the question of why do we keep some animals as pets and why do we keep some animals as like farm for, for, for breeding? Like why do we eat some animals and not others? And perhaps that's actually just a cultural thing because you look around different mm. cultures of the world that do practice different things in regard to different animals. Taking it back to the freedom point. Mm -hmm. So I think to take, to take it to the extreme, the concepts of positive and negative freedom, do they even apply to, say, for example, a bug? I mean, I could see that like, okay, you put a bug in a small case, clearly that's a negative freedom thing. But is there, is there a positive freedom case for bugs? Mm -hmm. I suppose you could say something along the lines of like fulfillment of normal life in in the sense of like okay we castrate animals we we spay at, at like our, our dogs and cats and stuff and that's certainly taking away some part that's pretty fundamental to what it is to to live a, a normal natural life meeting their natural instincts yeah and yeah hmm. yeah i mean you could possibly just make the case that it's about giving them the fullest ability to express their meow <laughs> 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 i was thinking of the case of um uh, conservation in Africa and, and elephants in particular, like they roam over vast areas and over the course of time, we've had to introduce like boundaries. So, uh, you know, so that they don't get into trouble, wander into poaching zones or, or like roads, roads, towns, cities. And people talk about, you know, does that actually take away an elephant's fundamental freedom to roam? What it is to be an elephant. Yeah, what it is to be an elephant exactly in, in terms of walking mm. vast distances in their, in their herds. Mm. So maybe it is relevant to how we distinguish the animals my intuition is that there is some sort of scale because when i think about positive freedom for say for example an insect okay i can see that in like part of what it is to be the insect is for example the ability to reproduce and to follow that instinct so to for example put them in a lab and take away that ability because you're using them for whatever test you know something is wrong there beyond just the negative freedom element but it does feel like on a scale it's and i'm saying scale that doesn't mean i necessarily agree with spectrum you you simply can't restrict them as much like this there's not as much to take away from them as there is an elephant, right? What it is to be an elephant is a much richer thing than what it is to be a bug. Wow, deep. Um, <laughs> okay, so wait, let's... I think, I think the fundamental question when it comes to pets is more around that negative, right? Right. It's, it's about like pet ownership legally is classed as a form of property. Mm -hmm. That's clearly, you know, do, do animals have the negative right not to be property? If we were to say animals have that negative right, then I suppose that outlaws not just pet ownership, but every other treatment of animals that we have, like labor uh and, and and lab testing and stuff like that and that I think practically what's the alternative release them all into the <laughs> wild <laughs> so what even is the wild nowadays like <laughs> yeah. how do you take like a pigeon and release it into the wild yeah i know i remember yeah. i was at the zoo in um there's like a little mini zoo in golders green park mm -hmm. golders hill park uh and you're walking past you know there's some pretty cool stuff there like pigeons in the zoo <laughs> wait, wait for it there's like wallabies, there's like King Julian one, uh, lemurs, the ringtail lemurs. Like, yeah, I like to move. They're, they're great animals there. It's, it, you know, for a little free zoo, it's awesome. And then one of them is a bloody pigeon. <laughs> it's, it's an African pigeon. And I'm like, wait, I see these, every, like, he's slightly different, but it's a pigeon. <laughs> need to think. Okay, I, I get what you're saying there. Are we leaning towards categories or spectrum? Because I, I feel like, you know, I feel like it's too extreme to say like all living things have equal rights. That's patently ridiculous, right? It's a really tough one. I actually don't know. I, I can't remember where we came to in the vegan argument. I feel yeah. like we talked about categories more enthusiastically yeah. than 
Yeah, I think categories is is the only way you can consistently be quite so against um, retention of animals for livestock purposes, but still own pets. Mm -hmm. That being consistent doesn't mean it's right. I actually think that the lines we draw between pets and livestock can be so arbitrary and weird sometimes. Well, he talks about pigs, didn't we? That's yeah, a particular yeah. case of a exactly. very intelligent animal that, yeah. unfortunately, because it meets a number of things, that... tastes good. <laughs> 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 exactly, <laughs> meets and ticks a number of farming boxes and isn't cute enough yeah no i i feel you i i would say i would say i lean towards spectrum but i feel this okay i'm articulating it now i'm getting it i would articulate it as spectrum but i feel like a lot of people naturally view it as a category mm -hmm. where they where they separate pets and and livestock my spectrum argument is part of the reason why i feel uncomfortable i don't understand why we're happy to argue that we should be respecting these animals and not, you know, trapping them, et cetera, et cetera, for our own benefit. But then because the benefit is your enjoyment and the pet isn't necessarily actively suffering, that that suddenly like collapses that argument. So that's that's my overarching feeling. That's why I'm kind of like, mm, I don't get why we have pets. It seems a bit unfair on the animals. Okay. Now, earlier you made a pretty strong charge. You're a slave owner. <laughs> <laughs> that pet ownership is a kind of slavery. I think, obviously, slavery has all sorts of connotations around abuse and not necessarily um, it doesn't have to but it, it it does right it has it has connotations it's not explicit it, i agree it doesn't have to be true definitionally there were kind slave owners i'm sure but uh obviously that it, Thomas Jefferson was a slave owner. yeah and, and people quote him all the time yeah, <laughs> i think he was supposed to be nice doesn't he have like illegitimate love children i don't know there was i swear there's like a, a key and peel sketch where like it's lots of african-americans and it's going through like people uh, and like all the white people are like, I'm related to blah, blah, blah. It's like Ancestry.com style <laughs> ads, right? And then every African-American person is like, I'm related to Je Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. I haven't seen that one. Uh, it's quite funny. Um, so yeah, that doesn't have to be true definitionally, but it does quite emphatically make, it, it, it drives home that point of like, is this wrong? And it, it sort of- Charges The benefit to the owner is the primary purpose. Yes. And yeah. when it's not beneficial to be benevolent, it may they may no longer be. Which to be fair, can can I happen with uh, pets? When a pet is annoying uh, or starts humping your leg, <laughs> you cut its balls off. Yeah, yeah, or humping other people's pets. Mm. But I'm benevolent to it all the, all the rest of the time, so it's kind. I remember that was um, <laughs> it was one of the most challenging things with uh, with owning dogs. I remember when we did get our male dogs castrated, and I was to be fair, I was. I was a teenage boy at the time, so I protested against this. I was like, this is horribly wrong. <laughs> I can't imagine anything worse. Yeah. And uh, I remember the dog coming home from the vet and he looked at me with such betrayal. <laughs> <laughs> like, Where are my balls, Jacob? <laughs> I sat with him and I was like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, man. Man, he looked at you. He's like, I had a chance of getting laid, Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you had both of our best chances. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, that's such a funny one as well. Like, We'll come to the putting animals down, but like one thing is we're so comfortable with, we, we, we lean so much on norms rather mm. than thought, right? We do stuff like that. That, that sounds terrible. we are like, I'm really kind to my pets. Like, is it that kind to remove their ability to reproduce and cut their balls off? Well, the reason it happens is like, it's, yeah, I know why it happens. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of, in some ways, conforming to societal norms and needs. It's for their, it's for their own benefit in the sense that, Oh, no, 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 Jake, I'm going to cut your balls off and it's, I'm going to tell you it's for your own benefit. Hear me out. There's too many things, Jake. Climate change, <laughs> I'm going to cut your balls off. Hear me out. It's because the hormones, etc., drive animals to behave in a way that potentially get them into the kind of trouble that means so, they get So what down. you're saying is, what you're saying no, is, when like a dog behaves, aggressive, right? This is but what point. you're saying is when a dog behaves like a dog naturally should, and it doesn't benefit my enjoyment as an owner, I can it's be incredibly cruel cool to them no, to no, fix that. No, no, it's not about your enjoyment. It's about, it's about the dog's own behavior and prospects, right? If, if, as a pet, not as a wild animal. Yeah, sure. Um, but it makes them aggressive. Yeah, which is negative by what measure? Well, the point, the point is... It's not negative for the dog. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, if you cut their balls off and make them less aggressive, then they're less likely to get themselves into the kind of trouble where you'd have to put them down. Because you can make the same argument about slaves. I, I'm sure there were slaves that were castrated. I, and I'm saying it's a terrible thing. No, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but I'm saying being aggressive is a natural part of being a dog. Yeah. In some instances. And in the case of like um, female dogs and female animals, you do it because actually it's like apparently it's medically beneficial. Like if you if you spay them, they're less likely to get all sorts of other cancers and diseases unless you're planning to breed from them so well i think the primary purpose that we do it aside from behavioral stuff is just to stop them breeding yeah it is, it is unless you're to breed them all right but okay since you're talking about slavery 
what is the legal definition of slavery? I looked this up. Ownership of a person. A slave is a person owned by someone, and slavery is the state of being under the control of someone where a person is forced to work for another. So work is actually a key word in there. A slave is considered as a property of another as the one controlling them purchases them or owns them from their birth. In slavery, the slave does not have a right to leave the owner or not work for them. Slavery is a form of forced labor. They do not receive any remuneration for the work that they do. So work becomes a key component, right? Like, if, and this is the thing. If you receive board and lodging for your work, you aren't a slave. If you receive some kind of remuneration for your work, you're not a slave. You're Wait, choosing to work. I, I feel like I'm, I don't know that I like this definition. One, work is not work is a typical but not necessary component. I, legally, it is. And uh, no, I don't. If, agree. if you just keep someone in your like house but don't make them work, they're just a hostage, right? They're not a slave. A slave has an element of labor. Interesting. Okay, maybe maybe pets are hostages then. <laughs> <laughs> and then also for pets or, or slaves as well, you said, oh, if you give someone board and lodging. No, because slave owners would give board and lodging. They still yeah. had slaves. That's interesting because I, I realized, as I was saying that out loud, I was like, <laughs> that doesn't sound quite right. I feel like that's talking more about a modern exchange. of it, Remuneration doesn't have to be financial. I think the difference between that is if you have the chance to leave. I think the, I think the fundamental thing is uh, around freedoms. I think the fundamental thing is, is that it's a definition of your relationship with someone as property. And then secondary, you don't, as, as a consequence of that, you do not have freedoms that you would normally accord a... Mm -hmm you know, free human being or animal, right? Yeah. So that, in that sense, when you think about it, it's that definition which I've made up and no one else has ratified. It's, <laughs> it's pretty convincing. I, the reason I looked this up was to see how I could get pet owners off the charge yeah. of being I, slaves. I, I noticed that the exact sentence is how to get pet owners <laughs> off slavery charges. So number one is if pets aren't considered to be working, is providing companionship work? Is that? Literally, yes. Really? Escorts. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime that you are doing something for someone else for their benefit, whether you want to do it or not, that does feel like you're doing work, right? Sometimes you might enjoy your work, but that's still work. Cool. Next one. <laughs> Pets are remunerated in the form of pet treats, <laughs> pet food. <laughs> can, I mean, can, can animals even be remunerated in, outside of? And legally, they can't have bank accounts. Wait. So what happens when there's like a like a Hollywood pig or whatever? Their owner makes Their the money. Owner makes the money, right? <laughs> I don't know why we even didn't know that. Yeah. That's so why you think about that? So yeah, you think that's always a bank account. What about all those stories where like someone dies and they leave everything to their cat? How rich is Alexander the meerkat right now? Mm, that's a super for non UK users won't know. But then I guess the the big challenge is animals can't consent to stay or leave. You could argue that they reveal consent in their decision not to run away, but I guess that depends on how you've set up your house. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, some animals, a lot of animals do run away. Also, another interesting story, an African parrot once flew onto my brother's bow. Those are expensive birds. He just he just flew up. He was like, ah, what up? <laughs> yeah, I'm a hostage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Depending on your definition, it's either a hostage or a slave. <laughs> But yeah, a fundamental point is around consent and freedom, right? Uh, freedom from not having your balls cut off, freedom to hump other animals with the same ilk. I guess, I mean, when I, when I was deciding this, I sort of thought, I don't really see it as a form of work necessarily. I guess you could make the case that animals are looked after and therefore remunerated. The, the one that actually challenged me the most was like, the they can't really consent whether or not to leave, unless you make a point of leaving the door open. But then as a pet owner, you have a duty of care whoa, to your whoa, dog, whoa, right? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Or your cat. Cats can run away. Yeah, I was about to say this. A lot, like actually the type of pet ownership I'm most comfortable with, not just because I'm a low commitment, low work person, would be a cat. Because or not not just any cat, right? But cat, you, you can get cats where like the cat kind of like doesn't even necessarily belong to anyone. He goes around some people and they get some food. So you get that that kind of that's actually like a consensual, mutual, beneficial arrangement. But the cat isn't owned by anyone necessarily, right? The cat could be a, a neighborhood cat. That's an arrangement I'm comfortable with. Yeah, it does make it sound like cats are actually in a better position than dogs <laughs> mm. in this example. Um, but in general, it does seem no, that's too too strong a thing to say. I was going to say, it seems that dog owners in general talk about like how dogs care more, there's a stronger bond and, and cats have this sort of like aloofness. Um, mm. But no, sorry, people are going to call me out on that because mm. people have very strong feelings about both of these things. The keen amongst you may notice that Jake has teleported. <laughs> so slightly different if you're watching the video uh, ran out of battery and sorry i had to plug in my laptop so um so jake the next thing you're going to tell us about we were just talking about how, how important it is to uh for animals to consent whether or not to stay right and then this raises a slightly relevant 
but tangential question of conditioning and breeding and have animals been conditioned over years of breeding to sort of feel certain ways about this like we talk about having domesticated animals right and actually more particularly we had a debate the other day about there's a there's a dog that comes in called ted it's bloody cute he's bloody cute and we were asking how well he'd survive in the wild would he survive better than we would i thought he would well i thought he would in ted's own it was like absolutely not this guy <laughs> <laughs> to be fair apparently he's a bougie dog he eats like expensive meat that might be him <laughs> no, it's not him, it's not him. but yeah i still think this is unfair because again flip this around talk about humans right if you'd have taken a bunch of people who'd been on a plantation and told them free now but get out and not given them any support and they were homeless yeah like a bunch of people would have really struggled potentially died depending on the circumstances but we're not talking about the specific like let's liberate them and see how they do we're talking more about like animals have been conditioned does that mean that they can even make sort of free right. choices right like it's it's not even so much about the transition it's about the fact they've been conditioned to love humans and got you so it's not that it's not that ted has i get you so it's not that ted himself has you know spent too many years blah 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 is that ted the animal you know whatever breed or mix of breeds he is like even if you raised him in the wild wouldn't be fit for it because we domesticated him i guess again like the fact that we've grotesquely domesticated them so that they're kind of distorted doesn't feel like a good justification right like yeah maybe that's true so what i yeah it doesn't necessarily have to be a justification does it, it but it's it's a point of practical relevance i have some fun facts about the history of animal domestication oh go ahead i mean it's something that's been happening for at least ten thousand years obviously it originated as a practice of you know we tame animals for meat milk uh their hides their skins etc etc they reckon goats were probably the first animals to be domesticated followed closely by sheep by ancient greeks or what i'm not sure yeah they talk about this happening in ancient mesopotamia yeah mesopotamia is actually between the tigris and the other river but it's you know around where iraq iran is around the sort of cradle of civilization area abalon why haven't people domesticated every kind of animal interesting question uh after all a horse and a zebra are pretty similar but you don't see many people riding around on zebras um and there's a biologist called jared diamond evolutionary biologist He's talked about six criteria that animals need to meet in order to, to be domesticated. They need to have flexible diets, reasonably fast growth rates, the ability to breed in captivity, a pleasant disposition, a temperament that makes it unlikely to panic, which sounds a little bit similar to four, uh, and a modifiable social hierarchy. So that's why animals like dogs are quite good because they're pack animals. So you bring them into your house and you're like, you're bottom of the pack, Mr. Dog. The dog's like, no, I'm not. I'm in charge of everything. Basically, they have a kind of sense of social hierarchy and that makes them easy to... Oh, wait, his, his term is modifiable social hierarchy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but you can Existent, that, modifiable. Well, but you compare that to like a tiger or a lion, uh, maybe not a lion, but tigers and leopards, which are like, you know, they're, they're fairly right. solitary creatures. They don't okay, have... Okay, so, so having no social hierarchy is definitely not having a modifiable one. Yeah. And some animals might have very strict social hierarchies, which might make them not suitable. But some animals like, mm -hmm. yeah, like are... are can kind of fit living with humans into the hierarchy. Fair enough. He says, with these characteristics in mind, it makes sense that a relatively good-natured pig is domesticated, while a violent warthog is not. But just to segue into pet keeping, people haven't actually kept pets in the way that we know it for that long. As in purely entertainment. As in, in form we talked about with like companionship, right? Like people reckon it's actually a Victorian invention. It's probably only been happening for the last hundred years or so. And even in Victorian times, it was the preserve of the wealthy. Like. Yeah. That's, that's funny to think about, right? Like for the majority of human history, we didn't have enough excess resources mm. to consider wasting them on animals who were, were, were like literally lap dogs often. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, with the, with the exception of like Chinese emperors and stuff, like it didn't make sense to waste resources on an animal that wasn't going to be of use. Yeah, well, I always think it's interesting to look back on stuff like that because I think particularly with pet ownership uh, I, I, and other things we talked about before, we're so used to the way things are now, but we don't realize in context that actually it's not been that way for very long. It's, it's a relatively new phenomenon. You know, in present day societies, dogs have a number of functional roles and, and they talk about like dogs being actually status symbols, their ornaments, ornaments. Their helpers. Companionship is, I think, still the one that we, we sort of mainly talk about. Interesting. It's it's a relatively novel phenomenon, which I think is is yeah. is a relevant thing to to bear in mind. Something for you. Uh, it might be Jared Diamond, even. Uh, it's name's familiar, or it might be the guy from Homo Sapiens. That's Yuval Noah Harari. Jared Diamond was the guns, germs, and steel guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he wrote a couple other. Like, I want to say like civil. He wrote some book that was very famous. It was Collapse. Was the famous one that I heard about. But I mean, he has several famous ones. He's a great, great author. I think it was Homo Sapiens, though, where he talks about why we brought diseases to america but america didn't have diseases to infect us with and part of what they mention 
was the exception of horses with uh, Native American tribes, although even then it wasn't as intensively as we did, domesticate or breed them. The main thing was that there weren't many domesticatable a- animals in, for example, South America. And living in close proximity with animals is an excellent it's, way to transmit and spread diseases, right? Yeah, COVID can confirm like bats <laughs> and pangolins in China. Exactly. But um, but yeah, that, that was one of the things that they suppose like they didn't have as many random mutations and viruses and stuff because they didn't live in close proximity with domesticated animals mostly because they didn't have as many. I mean, the closest they had is a llama. Llamas fail in 0.4, pleasant disposition. <laughs> really? Yeah, well, they're very, yeah. Are you thinking of the llamas with hats where the mm. llama kills other people? Llamas with hats. No, I think they're just very, they're very spitty. In the case of llamas with hats, the YouTube video, they're very uh, stabby. Um, and and I, I think they don't, I don't know that llamas have a strong sense of social hierarchy. So moving on, uh, you've talked before about animals and, and, and pet owners having a sort of slave-like relationship or, or hostage. Well, they're literally property. What if symbiosis was a better characterization? What if it's a case of mutual, mutually benefiting each other in, a, in the sense of like, <laughs> shaking his head at me already, mm-hmm. uh, in, the, in, in the sense that, you know, humans get companionship, animals get someone who cares for them and provides for their basic needs. Oh, what about, what if people have a symbiotic relationship where you live on my farm and do all the work, I provide you with housing and food? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're my property. I, again, that kind of comes back to that decision whether or not you can leave. But that's where, actually, I mean, cats, again, provide an interesting counterpoint. I know this is, actually, I was going to say it's fiction. It's not fiction. It's a, it's a biographical work, a street cat named Bob. Mm. Great book. I love, that's, that that Great name book. always makes me laugh. Yeah, awesome name. Um, and, and that's a relationship that evolved because it was a literally a stray cat that, uh, and, and the guy who wrote it um, was, uh, he was a recovering drug addict at the time. And actually having a cat in his life to, to care for gave him a greater sense of well-being and, and empowered him to make the changes that he needed to make in his life. But there were times in the film where, you know, Bob, the, the cat, runs off and he, he misses him but they sort of they do coexist a little bit more you know fluidly, independently, fluidly. It, 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 i see that i see that but then he's yeah but that's the point then he's not a pet a pet is a pet is almost by definition that kind of ownership structure which i think is just not symbiotic like the fact that you both benefit doesn't make it a symbiotic relationship right what because you can have that in the sense of like a slave owner slave being kind of slave right so the fact that like some amount of benefit exists on both sides doesn't make it symbiotic it's that like what is the definition? It's certain animals choose to closely coexist. I think it's just coexistence for mutual gain, right? You see symbiosis in the animal kingdom all the time. In the case of like, I'm thinking of, for some reason, whales and then those tiny little fish that clean them and yeah. the whales like... Sort of in, those case, in, those, in those cases, they choose to be together because they both benefit sufficiently. The fact that some benefit exists doesn't mean that both animals are, are choosing to be there because of the benefit. So what I'm saying is, if you if you have a relationship with two things, the fact that I confer some small benefit on you doesn't then turn it into symbiosis, right? But you could say it's a fairly big benefit. You're providing them the means of survival. Again, same. You just turn turn it into humans, and so like, of course, it's ridiculous to describe that as a symbiotic relationship. No, but animals would be much more vulnerable were you to let them go than slaves would be, right? And I think that's where that's where a charge of difference comes. Depends from. on the animals and stuff, right? And and also like the argument that you bred them to the point where they can't take care of themselves in the wild is kind of unfair in the sense that like well yeah but it's only because you bred them to the point where they can't survive in the wild like you could breed humans to that point you could people used to think that about slaves right that accusation was made let's wait whose point does that support mine or yours yours exactly <laughs> <laughs> let's move on from slaves mm. let's try a different question why is pet ownership different to having children you think about Do i really need to explain that you think about having kids um in a, in a state where they're vulnerable and you care for them and nurture mm. them and they don't have total autonomy they definitely don't have freedom to run away from home yeah why is it different i suppose a lot of people would argue that like children are kind of pseudo property but they're definitely not property right so for one you can't put down a child at your leisure um <laughs> you can't i think at your leisure is a bit harsh yeah well i mean you know what i mean like you could choose to put an animal down you don't need a very good reason to do so right like literally i've seen cases of People are moving far across the world and it just wasn't practical to move the animal with them. So they put it down. You can't do that with a child. So, so sometimes children might kind of look like property or behave practically like property, but clearly they're not property. And that's like the biggest distinction, I think. Uh, also, children become rational adults at some point, right? You're nurturing them through child, child stage, but they're not going to permanently be in that state. Okay, but what about the case of a kid that might have a severe life-impacting impairment? You know, something which means they're never going to be fully functioning autonomous adults because they're going to need nurturing and support possibly forever. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I think there's one, of, there's one of two circumstances here, right? So one, 
you are having a child and this happens and you know you didn't like select that it, it randomly happened and then you're kind of dealing with an unfortunate situation whereas you're saying you would select a pet right? yeah whereas you right. select a pet um, but then on the other hand, you know, there might be a circumstance where someone chooses to take um, such a child on, you know, perhaps that's more of an act of sympathy or charity as opposed to the, a typical parent child relationship, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think, it, I don't think most parents who are looking like, oh, I want to adopt a child, you know, are, are looking, the, the person who takes on someone with severe developmental issues or something like that is very different to the typical parent taking on a child, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to articulate because it depends a bit, but the reasons as to why they do that are surely quite different. The analogy I'm trying to draw there is just that we're, we're talking about two similarly vulnerable beings. And if you're approaching them, again, not as treating them as property, you're, you're trying to give them the best life possible, which mm -hmm. I think, again, is something we assume most pet owners are trying to do, right? They're not out to treat animals as like, well, again, not everyone, but like in general, mm -hmm. um, then, and there's overlap there mm -hmm. and there's, there's similarities and that's true no i i take the point I, it, there are some similarities and it can be hard to articulate i mentioned putting pets down mm. i guess one one argument could be that perhaps rather than us putting pets down is evidence that pets are different we're just too sanctimonious about euthanasia amongst humans i think it's something we definitely want to get into in another episode but I mean, I, i'd agree with that i think actually you... i mean not in the circumstance i described we're like we're going somewhere it's inconvenient <laughs> to take on holiday <laughs> yeah, we're moving to australia we can't practically take our dog so <laughs> we can't practically take grandpa so <laughs> <laughs> no, but there's more to talk about there, but it, it's true. We could definitely, uh, normally people consider putting down animals as a humane way to give them like a kind end of life. And actually certainly only arguments to be made that we don't treat our own elderly relatives as humanely when they're, they're sort of made to uh, suffer unduly. I don't want to get into that too much, but I think it's something people can relate to. Fair. We need to wrap up because I'm very close to running out of battery. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do this. Let's summarize. Okay. Jake, what's, you know, you started out like this is ridiculous to even discuss. Now that we've gone through it, how, how do you feel? It's more gray area than I hoped. <laughs> so look, I mean, we, we gave two reasons at the beginning as to why pet ownership is wrong or could be wrong. The first reason I think is a clear yes from me. I think any case in which an animal is being treated unreasonably or you can't meet their needs, fine. I'd, I'd agree that's wrong. I don't think that's contentious. I mean, that's just not... That's just not abusing living things. Yeah, yeah. As we talk about suffering. That's that's fairly clear cut. The second area about how should we recognise animals' rights? I sit somewhere in the middle. It's it, it's tricky. Um, hmm. And again, I mean, we made some important assumptions. If you're not a benevolent pet owner, then I think again that falls into the first reason camp. It's it's just bad. If you're having an animal purely for like as an ornament because it's it sort of makes you look great and and you're not really taking care of it. Taking care of it. In the, uh, well, it's kind of just straying into the. It's straying into the first reason, and I, and I think that's that's a fair assumption, but. In the case where, where most sort of families with pets fall, where they treat the pet almost as an extension of the family, it doesn't feel like treating the pet as property. You raise some excellent points around like, okay, you, you castrate, you wouldn't castrate your kids. You certainly like, you know, you wouldn't sort of keep them restricted to, uh, you, you wouldn't take kids for walks on lead, with leads, right? Like, no, no. <laughs> and it's, just, it's, it's funny. It's just little things. And it's like, oh, but that's what they're used to, where it's like, isn't it insane that you have this animal and it's only allowed to go to the bathroom when you say so, and it has to hold it for hours. Like imagine Imagine that, that I, I, I don't know. I, I, I know it's a weird and unpopular opinion, but I just, I think it's weird that we uh, like, particularly a lot of people who are you know, very kind of like, oh, how can we take advantage of animals for me and, and, and byproducts, particularly that a lot of those people are very like, I love pets. I, I personally don't really get it. I think it's a bit unfair on the animals. It seems a bit strange to manufacture life purely for your enjoyment and then to treat the living thing. Like, I, like, I think castration is the perfect example of where like, you know, it, it's clear cut that when push comes to shove, this being exists for your for your convenience and pleasure and enjoyment. And when it's not convenient, snip. <laughs> the only thing I'd say in counterpoint is I think just to talk about it being for your enjoyment maybe trivializes the extent of the benefit that hmm. humans and animals receive from from pet ownership. Right? And let's focus on the humans. I mean, let's let's leave animals to one side. Like companionship clearly is something that people get a lot of value out of you only need to look at stuff like marley and me and similar tributes to pets just to see how much like love and and, and joy 
people do get out of a pet animal relationship. Mm. And don't get me wrong, there's, there's, there is a certain perspective in which like that's really valuable and necessary, particularly for say old lonely people. Sure. But that's the animal strays back into being like a, a, a utility or work animal as opposed to a physical embodiment of my leisure and enjoyment. But then would you say it's correct to keep guide dogs for the blind, but not to keep general pets? Is it, yes. Are you drawing the line purely at the basis of like what you need them for? You're saying, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, for example, eat meat. So I don't, I, I think humans and animals are not like equal. I think that animals have significant rights, but you know, I do think that necessity for humans, because humans are more important, can override and also in the case of guide dogs, you know, it's actually much easier than, you know, I, like I said, I eat some meat, not huge amounts, don't worry guys. I'm very rarely, very rarely red meat. You know, I eat some meat, like it's not really hard in that context to consistently justify like, yeah, I think having a guide dog is fine, right? Okay, so you think it's like, much harder to justify that when you're like a hardcore vegan type. What about sheep dogs? Same, same deal? You're saying they provide enough utility that humans generate and then... They're not pets. Okay. So it's just, it's actually the fact that you get enjoyment out of pets you think is the, the point of having one the point of having one is enjoyment i'm just curious if you think that like the companionship pets could give to say elderly people is a subordinate need to oh, that's different that's like that that essentially is like a therapy dog but the same thing is true with families no i mean the older people enjoy more sort of needs yeah. and rights like yes no no the necessity for an old person who for example might lack other human connections is obviously higher than you know a family who's seen some movies and the kids are like mom dad i want a puppy i want a puppy oh i promise i'll walk it <laughs> again you're trivializing the the example right That's like not, that is not those children saying mom dad I lack connection in the real world and I feel that one of the easiest ways to deal with that feeling is to have a living being who is cute and cuddly and relies on me. But if a kid were to express it that way, would that be fine? <laughs> well, yeah, then it would just be a therapy dog. We're just describing therapy dogs. But, uh, okay, but you're, you're, are you sort of making the case that not everyone has that right to connection or like... No, I'm saying that some people don't need that from an animal, clearly. Like a, PT, a person with PTSD having a trained dog a blind person with a guide dog, you know, a particularly old person who like actually doesn't have any connections. Like, I don't understand why you're turning that into an argument. Like that is, it, it, that feels intuitively clearly distinct. I don't agree at all. I... You think, you think that an old person who has no connection where like, maybe they're seeing psychiatrists about their loneliness and stuff. And the psychiatrist is like, okay, I, I prescribe you a dog. But like the, the, the distinction of therapy dog, which is a literal like yeah. guided term is sufficient to, to make the difference between a pet and a working animal, even when the working is companion. Quote unquote. Yeah, okay. So if it's not a therapy dog, if a psychologist wouldn't describe it as a therapy dog, then it's not necessary enough. I think it's the same benefit being completely. You, oh my goodness. And it's just a question of you're saying how much people need it. I, well, I think guys, it's, a, it's an arbitrary line. I'm on 2%, so we'll have to cut it there. Yeah, gonna have Jake's to obviously it wrong. There. Tell us what you think. <laughs> tell, us, tell Jake that he's wrong. I, I will appreciate it. Actually, yeah, do seriously leave us reviews. Uh, and even if that means telling me I'm wrong, like yeah. leave a review anyway. Yeah. <laughs> comment, uh, you know, comment, if you think Jake's wrong, comment on the If you think I'm wrong, which I highly suspect more people are going to say. Yeah. Like, <laughs> 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 I'm right. hitting on having a dog. Like so many people but I love my dog. Um, but think about it. Think about it. Uh, it was, you know, fun guys. Video cast. Hello, YouTube. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Oh, get, get your job. Get, I mean, don't worry about me feeling a bit ill. I'll be okay. Get your job. <laughs> we'll be back soon with another episode. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Take care. Goodbye.